I graduated boot camp, you know, I remember crying because I, I was leaving my senior drill instructor. I mean, the impact those women had on me, just strong female positivity. Um, you know, it's like I, I found my place in the world. Hello, this is Tab Bartley, and you are listening to the Oath We Took podcast, the show that tells the Marine Corps story through the Marines that served. I'm joined today by Sarah Hutchinson. She is the reason for this podcast. I know so many amazing Marines hesitate to tell their stories. Their stories hold so much power and so many life lessons. Oftentimes, though, they go untold. Not every Marine's story is the same. What is the same is the oath that we all took. And so the first question that I always ask everybody is, why did you decide to join the Marine Corps? Um, so I, I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. I think there's a lot of pressure as a 17 and 18 year old that you're expected for some reason to know what the hell you want to do with the rest of your life. And I think that's really unfair, um, to younger people, especially nowadays with student loans and everything else. So I talked to each of the recruiters, um, gave them all a fair shot. And I was most impressed, obviously with the Marine Corps and the dress blues, um, you know, I think that is such a, a quality recruiting tool, whether it's a male or female Marine. Um, people laugh, but there's just something about our uniform. And then, um, you know, I talked to them all. I did, I did the delayed entry program, joined between my junior and senior year. Um, yeah, and it just fits. I've had um, a lot of male members of my family. I've had two Marines, a great uncle and an uncle. And then I had mostly... Uh, male army so i was the first female in my family to join the military and um i left 10 days after high school i i just turned 18 so i was super young and um never looked back how did your family feel about that decision especially like it being so like right after the marine or right after high school um i was really supported uh by both my mom and my stepdad and also my dad um basically everybody they were just super proud and i think i think i was luckily i I have a family of patriots you know people that believe you know god bless america we support and defend the constitution um i think that's important and um just to value that um sometimes people i think take it for granted people that may never have served their country or um, done anything other than serve themselves. Um, And I think it's important to be selfless, even, you know, volunteerism, that kind of thing. So I was really fortunate. I've always had people that pushed me and supported me throughout the career. And what MOS did you pick or did you pick your MOS? Did you go open contract? How was your job in the Marine Corps? Definitely. (laughs) No to open that. contracts. <laughs> Jesus. I, no, I mean, I understand the reason for open contracts. You know, the recruiters have a tough job. Um, no, I went, uh, took the ASFAB. I guess I scored well in, um, I don't know, I guess technical. I, I was a little surprised when I got, but I was an avionics electrician. So, you know, I didn't want to go to school, you know, after high school. And then the Marine Corps sends me to school for a year. Um so I had a five-year contract initially, but, you know, it all worked out and um, it was something different. Um, there's so many different paths in the Marine Corps, too, and I think people don't understand sometimes that when you when you join the Marine Corps, it's like there are so many different roads ahead of you, depending on how much work you want to put in and what you want to do for self-development. And I think that was always my mantra as a Marine, whether I, when I was enlisted and an officer was continuous self-improvement, keyword self. Um, so many people sometimes they expect like, oh, well, it's just going to happen. No, you have to put in the work for it. Um, and I think that's, I always got what I asked for or what I put a package in for, uh, excuse me, in for. And I had leaders that pushed me pretty hard, you know, and at first you're like, wow, this you know, this person, ooh. but afterwards, like once I understood what they were doing to develop me, you know, blessing in disguise. And, um, those are the types of leaders I really value. And, um, 
Yeah, I've had a lot of those. And people, obviously, I still keep in touch with today. But people that really, it's like when you have the imposter syndrome and everybody's had this and you're like, wow, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. You know, whether it's a physical thing with OCS or TBS, whether it's a mental thing, whether it's, you know, being away from your family, whatever that is. But those people that would just be like, Sarah, stop, you got this. And I think that is what younger people today, I, I don't know if they have that. Those people pushing them in the right direction, vice clearing a path for them, whether it's parents or anything else. Um, people can do a lot more than they think. But, you know, I just think sometimes you have to feel uncomfortable to branch out and grow. Um, and like I said, those are the, you know, I remember when I was deployed and my lieutenant colonel's like, Sergeant Mishka, you're going to brief the three star today. And, you know, at that point, my insides were like, oh, my God, I can't do this. And I did it. And that little thing just built the confidence. and then. You know, from there, it's like, okay, well, all right. I didn't, you know, nobody died today. Um, I was able to do that. So, again, those those people that push me, um, I think that's what developed me into who I am today. What was your first duty station in the Marine Corps and kind of like your first job and the first thing you, you did besides the school and all the training? Um, yeah, Mel's 14. Um, that was in Cherry Point, North Carolina, when there was a PSC and um, was in a high level, intermediate level electrician work center. So we didn't work on the flight line. We worked up on the gear that came off the flight line. Um, and yeah, that was, you know, new job, you know, new people, um, new you life, kind of find your place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New life. New. I've never lived in North Carolina before. Um you know, got to deploy on a UDP, um, unit deployment program to Iwakuni. And um, that was awesome. Um, that's where, you know, I wish I could have spent more time in my career in Japan. My last duty station was Okinawa. And man, if I could have just stayed there, um, you know, moved around a bit, but, you know, it wasn't the time. So um, yeah, that's what I did. Uh, the first duty station. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what would say, what would you say on when you were on the enlisted side was probably your most like impactful duty station or experience? So I think naturally that would be the drill field. Um, so I went there after a deployment in 2003, spent three years there, 2004 to 2007. And I always had three goals in the Marine Corps. Um, um, become a drill instructor, become an officer and retire. So People would always, that it, it was just easy to me. Um, how I got there was, you know, whatever path that was. But um, I think the drill field, you talk about people pushing you. That's the part, that is the moneymaker. Um, I know all special duty assignments are different, that kind of thing. But for me, it was like, it was like the second time, because the first time in my life when, I graduated boot camp, you know, I remember crying because I, I was leaving my senior drill instructor. I mean, the impact those women had on me, just strong female positivity. Um, you know, it's like I, I found my place in the world. Um, and then the second time was at Paris Island. So that, I mean, toughest tour, I get it. It was, you know, extremely difficult physically, mentally, you know, everything. But the confidence, like, when you feel yourself, like, there's nothing. It's like, yeah, I'll try it. Let's do it. And that's the part where when you see that transition in recruits and you being a part of that, um, that development of somebody else, another human being, that was the most important part for me. Um, and it, it, you, do get, you do get a little bit... Um, you just want to get to the next cycle. You're tired. You're hungry. You just want to get to the next cycle. But when you slow down and actually realize what you were doing for the organization as a whole, the Marine Corps, um, and developing those future leaders, you know, replacing yourself essentially, you know, how how important that is in the process. 
And I think that it is amazing that you said the drill field was more impactful than your deployments. Like, I think that mm-hmm. that just speaks volumes of you and your leadership. And like the fact that it was like you said that you're like, you're influencing the next generation of Marines and you, like you are making Marines and that that's more impactful than the things you went through on a deployment. That's just like, gave me chills. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think it's each deployment is different on what you do and what your mission is. Um, you know, obviously people have had more serious life impacts from deployments than I have. Um, but, you know, when you when you, you know, go on a deployment and you see a corporal, and this happened to me in Afghanistan. You know, I'm getting on a plane to go to somewhere else in Afghanistan. And here's this corporal by himself escorting a detainee. You know, and this corporal is probably, eh, we'll say 19, 20, 21 years old. And you see what he was doing. And then you look back at our civilian society right now and you see what 18 to 21 year olds are not doing. And I think that's the part that, like, I think you and other Marines and other service members, we can understand what I mean by what what he was doing on his own. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it's funny because sometimes, you know, it, it the transition to civilian life, it's difficult. I will, I will be the first to tell you that. Um, but when you see what people stress out about sometimes in the civilian world, is that really like, can we just take a breath? Like, is that, is that really that serious, you know, compared to what, you know, other people that have deployed and seen what people do under pressure and what they do for the people around them. So I think that there, there's a huge gap there. Um, You know, and if, if I could take, Hey, let's go on a field trip to Afghanistan, I'll take 20 civilians. Not that that would happen. I'm just being hypothetical, but, and you see how people live. You see how people eat. You see, you see, you know, Afghan people and how they live and eat. And you see those things. And that's the part where, you know, when you have the blinders on of what our society provides for us, I think that that can be a little dangerous. So I, I think I always want to make sure not to scare people, but to help them appreciate what they have as an American. Um, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. And how was, you know, because when you went through, females were still separated completely. So your whole structure as a drill instructor was your entire leadership was females. Yeah. How was that experience? Because I I know for me, that was something that like going in the Marine Corps, it just had such an impression because like you interact with males. It's not that you're not interacting with males, but it's like all the authority it's these badass women, like just straight, oh, like bad amen. ass, like just like, yes. how was that? I, my time at fourth battalion, um, Papa company was Papa company here. <laughs> what? Hey, That's Papa. what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And now we, we no longer have a battalion. So Yeah. You know, I have mixed emotions about that. And I think that I, you know, I'm retired now. I guess I can be, <laughs> I, I don't know if I agree with the integration and just for what you said, Tab, there is, there is a power and a strength in having strong females in your entire chain of command and to show these young recruits that, yeah, you're, le- you're Lieutenant Colonel is doing pull-ups with you. Yeah, she's a badass and she's in her 40s. Um, your sergeant major is also a badass. Um, yeah, she's doing pull-ups too, or she's running faster than you. You know, she's twice your age. You know, and I think that's the, you know, it the Marine Corps did what it did. Okay. But I, I really my time there, you know, there's you had to get along with everybody. You know, people always be like, oh, all female battalion, but that's super catty. No, it wasn't. But but thanks for thinking that we can't handle ourselves, you know. So um, 
you know, and there was always the the jokes about, you know, fourth battalion or this, because, you know, we had smaller platoons, we had this, you know, whatever. Um, and my husband, he was in Gulf Company, second battalion. Um, you know, it, it's just, it is what it is, but I really thought, you know, I go back to me being a crew in 1996 and, you know, see my entire chain of command, except we had a male sergeant major. Um, but like, it was, it was awesome. Like my company commander, my serious commander, my first sergeant. I never saw a first sergeant in the fleet until I got back to the drill field because in the air wing, we didn't have first sergeants. So it's like, it was new to me, um, you know, as a staff sergeant. And people were like, you know, I, I knew first sergeants, but I didn't, it wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think that that was a gem that future female Marines they're, 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 you know, they may miss out on some things because I, I thought it was awesome. And, you know, when you go to a female first sergeant and, you know, I had one, you know, she was just awesome, but she was hard on us. You did something you weren't supposed to first sergeant, you want to, she will take care of you and you take it because you respect her so much. And, you know, I, I personally wish I, it would have been kept separate. Um, it's just, it's not a slight to male or female if you're not integrated. And, you know, I females perform different when there's a band of strong females around them. I personally believe that. Females need a tribe. We're different. That's okay to say. Males are different. Um, you know, but females... Speaking for my life personally, you know, I, I need my strong female girlfriends around me. And I know that I can text them. I can call them at a certain time of the day and they're going to, they're going to pause their life for me. So, yeah, I, I, I think the integration, you know, like I said, it was done for specific reasons, but I loved having an all female battalion and Yeah. And that's how I am too. It was super like mixed emotions where like I can understand things, right? And but it's I think it's hard seeing like something like become a part of history that then like okay, like it used to be such a thing to be like, yeah, all females are from Paris Island. You know, we're not Hollywood remains. Yeah. We we go to the the right. hardest place and there, there's something with that and with the, and I, I love that females and males are in the same uniform, but at the same time, like I had this moment when the uniforms changed that I was like, I'm going to be buried in a uniform that Marines aren't wearing anymore. And there was something about that that was a little like, uh, a little just yeah. like raw. I don't know. It's like that mixed mixed, I think is the best, the best way to describe mm -hmm. it. It's just a very mixed, like mixed thing to be. <laughs> yes. I I concur. So what made you decide that you wanted to be a Mustang and, and go the officer route as well, especially when it seemed like you were really like enjoying your time enlisted, you, you know, were a drill instructor and did these things. What made you want to become an officer? The, okay. So the, I would say when I was in avionics, I always had Mustang officers. So all my majors, my captains, they were LDOs. Um, and I, you know, I had one that, um, Lieutenant Colonel Heidel, he was one of my bosses when I was at Marple Pack and he would, he'd be like, Hey, okay, here, here's the PES manual, write your own fit rep. <clears throat> and I'm like, excuse me, sir. He's like, write your own fit rep and then we will discuss it. So the way he was, um, with me, like I said, the self-development, him and my master guns pushed me pretty hard. And um, he'd be like, all right, how many classes are you taking? What classes are you taking in this, you know, this semester? So I remember, like, I would be taking three classes, off-duty education, you know, TA, paying for tuition assistance. So I started college um, as a corporal before I PCS to Hawaii. Um, but he'd be like, okay, what classes are you taking? So I'd be taking three classes in my off time every eight weeks because you could go continuously all year. Um, you know, this was before 
you know, children. This was before everything else. So I really focused on getting all of my education done and paid for by the Marine Corps. So both, both my bachelor's degree and then my master's degree. But um, so he was a Mustang. You know, like I said, I have some very strong mentors. They were all Mustangs. So I decided I didn't want to be a master sergeant in my MOS. I didn't want to be a first sergeant. I, I just, that's not a career path I wanted. So I decided to put in for uh, a package for ECP um, the year after the drill field. Yeah. And then um, I had to have an age waiver. You know, I was 30, God forbid, but Ooh. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like, oh, okay. So I have my Thanks. age waiver. I have my, yeah. So I did the enlisted commissioning program, which is basically you get selected and you go straight to OCS because you already have a bachelor's degree. So, um, yeah, that that's kind of what, in my personal opinion, all of my best officers were Mustangs. But of course, as I became an officer myself, and then I saw, started seeing, you know, um, I say normal officers, but normal career path for an officer. You know, I, I had different mentors, you know, and then, um, you know, I just, you know, one one officer in particular, I served with him when he was a captain. He was my company commander when I was a sergeant and a staff sergeant. Then when I went to Okinawa, my last duty station, he as a colonel promoted me to major. You know, and when you see that, that progression of two people, and again, you know, I mean, we had captain touch through the years because he served with my husband at Third Marines. Um, you know, it was just like, God, you know, he's like, oh my God, he's like, you know, you know, Sarah was, you know, the last time I saw Sarah, she was going to the drill field, she was doing this, and she's always done everything, you know, she's ever wanted, um, you know, and it was just, it was really neat to see that, and that, that's how that happened, um, but again, it's, I think that's the part where, you know, the Marine Corps keeps going, you know, we come and go, um, and that's, that's just how it is, but it's those people that, you know, continue our, our values and continue our, um, our leadership traits and things like that. And, um, you know, I think that is what makes us very unique and different. Um, you know, we're small, but mighty. So, um, you know, and, and it's, it's amazing. Cause when, you know, I'm in a, uh, female shooting league here at Thursdays at the sportsman club down the road. And, um, you know, the first time I go there, there's a gentleman, he's kind of like a mentor. He, you know, does some things with us and he's got, you know, his Vietnam veteran Marine Corps EGA hat on. And it's like, you know, you just go up to somebody, offer your hand and you say Semper Fi and they're like, their eyes just kind of lay up. They're like, you know, and it's just like, there's an instant connection. And, you know, even when I go to the VA clinic here in Green Bay, which is phenomenal, um, you know, same thing. You see people walking around. Um, and, and you just, you talk to people or there's, you know, there's just the, oh, I was a Marine. I was, I'm a, I was in the army. I was this, I was this. So that veteran connection is, is very important to me. Um, and you know, I, I think just trying to keep involved in different things is, you know, I think that keeps you young and it keeps, um, our traditions alive. Hello, listeners. The Oath We Took podcast can now be heard on Wreaths Across America Radio. Download the iHeartRadio app and tune in to Wreaths Across America radio station every Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, I challenge you to not think a Marine, but listen to their stories instead. Was there things that you struggled with more on the officer side than the enlisted side once you had switched over that like maybe was easier when you were enlisted or things that you just didn't know that you were going to deal with or you had to handle in a different different way because you were an officer? Um, yes. So going from an E7 to an O1E, it's very humbling. Um, you know, I had people... You know, because when you put on the second lieutenant bars, you know, people, they give you the, oh, here we go. They don't know anything, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, and I had some senior enlisted people try that. Didn't work really well. Um, <laughs> I may have been, uh, I may have been a little bit more rough as a second lieutenant. Well, I have people that would tell you it was, but you know, I always, I always had them at the bottom of my email. Your, your rank, rank met is far less than talent. And I put that on there mostly for my junior Marines because when people see you in camis as a sec lieutenant and they want to treat you a certain way, even though you've been in the Marine Corps at that point for like 13 or 14 years, you know, and then they see you in your Charlies and you have a bigger ribbon stack than they do. That's a difference. And that's, a, like I said, that's one visualization where people are like, oh, well, where is he or she been? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you don't, you don't treat people like crap because you think you're a bad, you know, badass master sergeant or first sergeant or whatever. There's no place for that. So that's kind of what I think I didn't have troubles with it, but you know, it's like, you know, sometimes the crap the second lieutenants deal with, I saw and I felt it's just how you react to it. I was, like I said, I, I, I was in a different scenario because I had been around the Marine Corps, maybe not the officer side, but yeah, I'd been around the Marine Corps at that point. Um, you know, and it's just, I can have the, you know, an, an E3 who will run circles around people because they have a, there's, they're, you know, I help development, develop them into this and this skill and that kind of thing. But, you know, when you, back your people. I think I did a, a fairly decent job about doing that as an officer. Like when you back up your people and you are confident in what they can do, they see and feel that. And that only helps them develop. That only helps them set goals for themselves and do other things. And, you know, I mean, no one should mess with your Marines. For sure. Your people. Yeah. Those are your people. Um, you know, and it's like, sometimes people, they got to be checked a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how they react sometimes is how you can deal with that. So it's just situational dependent. Um, yeah. you know, but I think, I, I don't know. I, I, I wanted to become an adjutant, which is now a manpower officer at the time because I felt, um, I felt I would be good at it. I had my bachelor's degrees in justice administration, you know, becoming a legal officer, that kind of thing. And I think I worked well for my exos, sergeants, major, and my COs, you know, the, the leadership team. So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's where you're placed, you know, and some people do get a raw deal because they're, they're not always the best leaders. You know, you take what you get from every yeah. leader, whether they're, good or bad and that kind of thing. So um, I had to learn to be more patient, I think, as an officer. Um, That's interesting. I don't think I've yeah. ever heard that. Yeah. And I, and I say because I was learning. It's like you're, you're learning as a, a young officer. You're thrown into, you know, whatever unit, that kind of thing. So you're, you're trying to learn as much as you can very quickly. So sometimes you have to be patient and slow down a bit. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I had some awesome um, staff judge advocates that, you know, they're lawyers. It's different from being a legal officer. And I would reach out to them, you know, daily. I, want, I remember when I was at TUMEF and, you know, I you had to have paperwork that was correct, especially in legal proceedings and that kind of stuff. So, you know, just the advice that they would give me that, you know, I mean, but if I was too proud to have reached out to them as a second lieutenant, like, oh, I got to figure this out on my own. Now, sometimes a phone call can save you a world of hurt. And um, those those were the people that really helped me develop. Again, it, it just goes to self-development with, you know, outside help. But, you know, those people, you know, I will, I will never forget their names and what they did for me and how they helped me make sure that my unit and my CO, his intentions were met. And yeah, so 
And that was one of my favorite things about the Marine Corps was like this collaboration because I was in an MOS that was smaller that you really had to reach out to people who had done the job before or had done something like it was a constant like you had to ask for help and ask for like advice and guidance and those type of things. Um, But at the same time, you also personally were you at a different spot in your life than your peers in regards to like, you know, marriage and children and starting a family and that type of stuff. Yes. So when I went to OCS, I was 30. Um, I had one daughter. I went to OCS when she was 11 months old and my husband was still in Iraq. So that was awesome. But I mean, looking back, sometimes, you know, my husband retired in 2018 as a sergeant major. I retired in 2021. And, you know, we met as staff sergeant. So it, it was different because, you know, you know, people at TBS or whatever, um, oh, let's go out. Let's do, I, I don't even know where the hell they went in Virginia. I mean, I just, I didn't, I wasn't at that point in my life. I was, I had to pause my master's degree to go to OCS and TBS, you know, and I had one, one child. And, you know, once I got to my first unit as a second lieutenant, you know, my in brief with my XO, I'm like, sir, are we deploying? He's like, well, we don't deploy as a unit. We deploy companies. I was at a communication battalion. I said, okay. He's like, well, why do you ask? I'm like, well, sir, we'd like to have a second child. I'm 32. Well, I was 31 at the time. You know, my husband's not deploying. Um, or no, he wasn't. But so, you know, it's like I, I gave him the common courtesy of, he's like, wow. He's like, thanks for asking me that. Or, you know, I'm like, disgust me. I'm like, absolutely, sir. And so I'm not going to come to the unit and then we deploy, you know, it's just, you have to time things. And I think sometimes people, it, it's like, well, no one should pressure me into when I can or cannot have a child. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is sometimes, you know, you got to plan your life a bit, you know, let's be a little proactive instead of reactive. So that's what I was doing. You know, and then it, it it worked out really well because, you know, I was able to be home, not home, but I was able to have my child and not worry about deploying because I understood my the teeth for my unit. So, um, yeah, so I was in a different spot. My husband was, um, he was a gunny when I went to the dark side. Um, so, you know, all this stuff, it's like, you know, he was an AM tracker. I was like, okay, I would like to be an MOS where I can at least get stationed with him and all this stuff. So it's like, we, we thought about things a lot and, you know, it was just, I want to do something different, I, different from what, you know, I came from the air wing. So I wanted to do something different yeah. and it just worked out where I, it fit with my personality and, you know, um, but yeah, so I was in a different spot because I was thinking, okay, I'll do, I always thought I'd do 10 years as enlisted, um, 10 as an officer, and I went a little bit over to did 12 and 13, you know, and it just, that's how it worked out. But was, yeah. was there a lot of differences or did you experience things differently as a pregnant enlisted compared to being pregnant as an officer? Were there things that you noticed as like drastically different or was it pretty similar experience? I think it was a similar experience. You know, there was, um, I breastfed both my daughters, even as an active duty Marine. So I think that was extremely important to me, um, just for their future health and everything else. Um, and also for me for weight loss. I mean, it was amazing. I think the biggest thing too, is like we, I had a lactation consultant come into the Camp Lejeune Naval Hospital a hospital that helped me, you know, because the first time I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, yeah. you, you don't as a first time mom, but they give you this amazing breast pump. They have all these support services for you. And to me, because I, I don't think it was being utilized enough. There were younger Marines having children, you know, we're talking, you know, Lance Corporals, Corporals, that kind of thing. They didn't breastfeed. They didn't, it's like they didn't utilize all the services that were available to him to them and that's the part where I was like this is amazing you know um and I think that again if there's female mentors that you know can help these younger marines you know 
tell them where to go to get the pregnancy camis, do all this stuff. And I think that that's what you I tried to do after I had my first child in the Marine Corps. You know, but again, I think the first, my first, let's see, I, I gained a lot of weight because I guess I was thin because the doctors kept telling me, you know, you need to, you need to gain more weight. You need to do this yeah. stuff. I, uh, one of them, I gained 65 pounds. One I gained, I, I can't even remember. But I remember coming back after my six weeks of maternity leave and that weight was gone. And I, I attribute that to, well, I started PTing as soon as I could, um, even with C-sections, you know. I mean, just get out there and move your body. But, you know, breastfeeding, I think, is super important, you know, for the health of the child, the health of the mother. And even just the, how many calories, like, it burned for me. Um, it, it's just that's that's how it worked out for me. Um, but, again, you know, I asked other females. I was very open to asking other females, like, hey, what do I uh, – I got to go to the, you know, um, the daycare on base, get, you know, I had to get my child on list really early, like all of these things, but no one's going to do that for you. And I think that that's a choice when you decide to become a mother, you know, on active duty or even, you know, as a reservist, that kind of thing. There's a lot more different things that you have to think about. Um, you know, every time you PCS, okay, where are my kids going to go to school, blah, blah, blah. But again, there's so many resources that people that I reached out to. You, you know, I remember calling a lady in Yuma, Arizona from Hawaii. Like, ma'am, I'm coming in. She was like the, uh, like education liaison with the schools yeah. in the Yuma era, area and everything. And um, she was fantastic. She's like, thank you so much for calling me before you PCS, not getting here and just expecting me to handle it all for you. I'm like, is that what you go through? And she's like, I do. And I, that, that upset me because here's this civilian awesome lady who knows Yuma, you know, like the back of her hand, she's from there. And she's like, you know, people just expect it. Oh, well, you need to get my kid in the school. No, that's not how it works. Um, you know, and I think that that when you have children in the Marine Corps, it, it totally changes things. But again, you're the parent people don't do everything for you. You, ha you have to figure some things out on your own. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and I will say, so I, I had my first child, um, when I was a corporal and the only female that I knew well enough, she was my Sergeant, but she was a little older. So when it came to the pregnancy, I was like, kind of comfortable asking her, like she was there if I needed her. But when it came yeah. to the breastfeeding, it was such a strange thing to me. Like growing up, I didn't know anybody who breastfed <laughs> and I tried really hard, but I didn't feel comfortable enough to ask. And all of my peers were way younger, right? Like my office as a whole was like either they were either like literally way older or way younger. And it was just like <laughs> yeah. a strange place to be. Uh, but for my second and third child, I was on recruiting duty and there were multiple females on recruiting duty who had either breastfed, you know, a year before or like yeah it was more peer level and my experience with breastfeeding there compared to first child at Quantico you know like junior ish marine was such yeah. night and day because we were able to like talk <laughs> about things but the funnier thing is it wasn't just them it was like I remember my my CO I remember you know because I had an office because I was the MPA pumping in my office and then we had the one communal fridge which is where I put my stuff and I would have to clean my pump stuff in the sink and I'd always be like who's gonna come in here my CO is like comes in as I'm cleaning my pump pieces and just talks to me like it's no like that it's nothing and it was yeah. such a like eye-opening thing like recruiting duty uh, there were so many male marines who had were married to female marines and or had families and yeah. it wasn't weird for them and it wasn't strange for them and I'm still here like what do I do like yes. You made the, I, I pumped in the, you know, the big branded F-150 and H-3. I, ha, I multiple times had to pump in that at events and be like, don't let anybody open the door to the rest of the Marines. And they were just like, got you. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember pumping in my office when I was at AFCOM and um, I had a, I had a sign that I would put on the door. I forgot what I put on there, but like my CEO, he would be like, I had you in there. I'm like, yes, sir. I'm just taking care of something. He's like, oh, I got it. And he, like, 
again, he, you know, he was a married man with older children. So, but it's like, I think we put more pressure on ourselves that I agree. we're, yeah, that we're like doing something. Oh my God. You know, I think I nowadays, agree. especially it's, yeah. Okay. Got a pump. You know, cool. <laughs> right. And I think it helped my husband, you know, as like a gunny first art star major later, later in his career, because, because he would have females. He's like, he would call me. He's like, babe, I have this female, blah, 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 a situation or whatever. He's like, can you talk to her? I'm like, absolutely. You know, which that dynamic, I'll come over there and that, you know, and it was like, yeah, I got it. Or I had a male Marine or something, you know, Oh, I remember at Hawaii or when I was at Marfort Pack, females could go become um, AAVs, amphibious assault. So that was, you know, that that transition. Um, and at, there was a young corporal. She was badass. She was strong. She was a really good swimmer. And she, for some reason, we got talking, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, man, I'm putting in my package for. I think I was a company commander at the time. Yeah, and she was like, I'm putting in my package to be." Um, go to, um, you know, AAVs. I'm like, awesome. I said, do you want to talk to my husband? He was, you know, he was enlisted AAV. And I was the first sergeant over at third Marines. You know, you can talk to him and the, the detachment over there if you need to. And she's like, oh, that'd be amazing. Blah, blah, blah. So like my husband had a conversation with her where it's like, you know, I mean, he, you know, and it, it's just, you know, when you just, you're opening yourself up to having a, a short, talk with somebody I, and I think that's that's a different kind of you know mentorship too where it's like oh I know this person who did this do you want to talk to them yes I do you know that networking um and again you just have to be open to it but if I hadn't have taken the time to talk to her about what package she was needing or my signature on then I never would have known that and you know linking her up with my husband who was that as a junior marine so yeah, it, it, I think that's very, very important. Um, and there's such a dynamic, I yeah. think, that dual military spouses bring to their units and the military in general that just like, I know it's such an interesting dynamic. It's there's so many like additional challenges with it. You know, mm -hmm. I was married to an FMF yes. corpsman. Um, and oh, like, gosh, he, yeah. He had to decide to get out because it's like, are we going to be able to parent together? Like, you know, like looking oh, at our careers, it's like, yes. there's no, like, we probably will never align again. It was like, do we, like, yeah. how do we make this work? Um, and so there's so many, I think, additional challenges, like on top of all these other things that then you also had the challenge of being dual military. And then one of you mm -hmm. being enlisted an officer, what were some of those challenges or, or maybe something that that you guys like made you stronger, made your marriage stronger or something that you would say to like those other dual military service members out there? Um, so I, I have, that's a little sore spot for me. Um, and I'll explain why. So my husband and I, we were married in 2005. He retired in 2018. In 13 years, we PCS together one time. So a lot of people, they don't have that experience. Awesome. I'm, I'm very happy for them because I know what I went through. So guess who was always the one packing up the house, taking the kids, getting the pets, all this stuff. That was me. So I, I and I, I love my career. I love my husband's career. We had, you know, great experiences. Um, but I think that that, that, um, that like pressure, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it was, it was always, you know, needs in the Marine Corps. And I get that. Okay. And it was great that we kept getting promoted. Okay. Yeah. You know, he got his goal. How many E9? I became an officer. That was my goal, that kind of thing. But, you know, I, you know, at the, the last, the last time before he decided to retire, the same thing was going to happen. Um, I had asked, I got selected for major and I had asked, you know, I'd love to go to Okinawa. My husband wants to go to Okinawa, all this stuff. And it was just very, I knew it was going to be wishy-washy, you know, oh, monitor, oh, all the stuff. And it just, you know, I remember breakdown crying in Yuma coming home and I'm like, 
I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, I don't, something's got to give. And he's like, babe, he's like, there's no E10. I'm retiring. And I'm going to get emotional. Um, <sighs> you know, he, he did that for our family. And, uh, like, when you meet your person, you know, he's my person. Um, and he did that for our family. And so I could do, you know, my dream job, <laughs> operations officer, kind of funny. But that was my dream job before I retired um, or being an XO, one of the two. So I got to be an operations officer at 3 Meth, which was amazing. <sighs> but, um, you know, and then when he retired, he just became you know, the ultimate house husband, <laughs> um, you know, and he enjoyed his time in Okinawa because he knew people over there, you know, the Marine Corps was so small. So he's like, oh, I'm going golfing with this guy I served with when I was a corporal. And it was amazing. Um, you know, so we had a really awesome last tour in Okinawa. My daughters love Japan. Um, you know, it was, it was awesome. But I had, you know, when my Marines always used to be like, oh, man, you know, what do you have for lunch? Or, you know, because I packed my lunch every day. I was like that old officer that did all that stuff. And um, I'm like, oh, yeah, Hutch made ribs and he did this and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what what does your husband do? I'm like, he takes care of us. Um, you know, I had, I always told people, I said, my house, you, I have a retired Marine who was a drill instructor taking care of me and my daughters. Like, he could clean our little tiny house like Camp Mactur you know, Macturius, um, you know, like 20 minutes. I didn't have to worry about anything. It was amazing, you know, but just the kind of way that that all happened, you know, that was tough. But, you know, like he said, he's, you know, he's a big babe. I'm a retired star major. He's like, this is, that was my goal, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's just how it all worked out. Um, and it did work out for us. So it's good. It's just, you know, if I could think of like a, you know, a, a dual couple, like even you and yourself or your husband's a sailor, there is no guarantee that you'll ever be stationed together again. No. And I don't know. I, I just, I, I don't know. It Sometimes I'm like, you know, maybe more have, could have been done. But if you have two E4s, you know, we'll say they're married and, you know, they had a baby. I mean, what they go through. And that's what we were. I mean, we were both E4s. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, it's sometimes it's like, well, why aren't people wanting to join the military? Well, there's some things that, you know, we could try to improve and, you know, like I said, it, it is needs of the Marine Corps. We're all replaceable. You know, I used to tell my Marines all the time, like, hey, if I die tomorrow, the assistant app, so, you know, they step up. You know, it's like, we are not one of one. Um, so I get that. But, you know, if, if there was just a little bit more flexibility sometimes for, you know, even single parents or dual active duty, anything, but... um. You know, I th I think there's some growth there, but but again, it's you know the machine is what it is, um, and it, it and and it does suck because sometimes these people, you know, how many you know I I know you you can relate to this tab when you talk to a male marine sometimes like oh yeah my wife was a marine oh you know it's like you know and it it's usually the female service member female partner. That does get out ultimately. Um, yeah, they do because either you know they're having those challenges that both you and I face, or they're they're like, well, I, you know, I don't want to do do the mom thing and then do this because it is difficult. It's yeah. difficult. There's that mommy guilt. Oh my god, that is, um, man, that was like, um. You know, that was, I think, difficult. And I think when, when I decided, you know, I, I knew going to Okinawa in 2018 that I was retiring after three years. You know, I, I told all my bosses, I think I had three different bosses at the time, like, ma'am, sir, you know, I'm retiring. And they're like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, okay. 
you know, because I knew I was, um, because my daughters were going to be middle and high school. Yeah. And I wanted them to be in one area. I thought that they had, you know, my, I forgot my youngest Reese, she moved, I think she had five or five different schools before we got to Okinawa, you know, and we got there in 18. So she was eight. So, you know, it's like, I think my girls are, I don't know. I, I think it served them well at, you know, now 16 and 13, especially with traveling. I think that was the most important part, the different cultures, everything that they had in Okinawa and when we mm-hmm. traveled over there before, you know, the pandemic and everything. But um, I wanted stability for them because I think that they deserve that as military kids. So that's why, you know, we're now in Wisconsin. We're, you know, whatever they want to do, we're going to do or try that kind of thing. So, and it's okay for people that don't, you know, they stay in their whole kids, you know, career or their career, but then their, you know, their children move so much and, you know, but I can't imagine being in a high school, you know, moving my high schooler. I think that for me, I think that's why I wanted to retire when I did um, Mm -hmm. just so they could have, you know, some time in a middle, middle and high school. Yeah. And how was the transition out of the Marine Corps for you? Um, I think it was, it was good because I prepped super early. As soon as I hit, you know, 14 months, I dropped my appendix J, all this stuff. And um, I remember taking my appendix J as a, as a courtesy because, you know, my, my Colonel was not my CO. It's different, you know, at the map. And, um, I remember he he looks at he goes I'm not signing that or he made a joke and he I'm like well sir you don't sign it you're not the CEO he's like does Hutch know about this um referring to my husband and I said yes sir I discussed this with Hutch and he's (laughs) like do I need to call him you know and I was just like oh my gosh you know and he he was one of those bosses where you know if I could have had him as my boss like the rest of my career like you would have stayed in the, yeah, forever. forever. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, you know, when you have that type and it's a loyalty, obviously to the person, but you know, I mean, what, what he, I mean, he backed me 110%. um, You know, he just, the trust and confidence he had in me was something, I mean, that is, that is sacred. So I think that my transition was, was hard because of that, but I also sent my family home to Wisconsin because we found a house and um, six months before I left Okinawa. So, you know, I knew what I was coming home to and that kind of thing. But I will say it took me, in my opinion, for me personally, it took me two years to like decompress. And I am fortunate because my husband and I, I've always been a financial nerd. Um, I've always done the finances and the investing for my family. So I had a husband who trusted me in that regard, which was amazing. But we got to, you know, goals that we had financially. So we haven't formally had, like, I would say real jobs. We've started some LLCs. We've started, you know, that kind of thing. But we we have flexibility and we have time. And that, I think, is the most precious resource in regards to, retiring yeah there was no scrambling um oh my god i have to have a job making this much money there wasn't that we had time to focus on our house and what we wanted to do here you know i've always wanted chickens i uh, have goats we have a rabbit we do 4-h we you know all these things so um we always planned you know as soon as we got married. We both knew we were, we were having careers. We were retiring, that kind of thing. So we planned to that end state. Um, and I think some people, especially younger Marines sometimes, um, or service members that get out, they, they may not have that five or 10 year plan. And then they're, they're kind of like, Oh, now what, (laughs) you know? And it's, I mean, like I said, after, even after 25 years, I'm like, what, what else? You know, and I think as of late, I've been finding out I need something more. And I miss being part of a team. I really do. That's the part where I'm like, 
you know, but then when you look at the outside, the civilian, it's like, I don't understand company structure sometimes. I don't understand like what somebody's position actually does in the company. So it's like, oh my gosh. So I found this, I even forgot. Oh, one of my assistant ops, though, he told me, he's like, oh man, you need to check out um, Dartmouth has a program called the Tuck Next Step Program. It's, I guess it's like a mini MBA. I'm starting it. I got selected for it. So, but it's for veterans and elite athletes. So people that, you know, I mean, they've been focused on their, you know, professional sports career or their military career. So, you know, you, you do a virtual week. And I mean, these, these courses and it's Dartmouth. So I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm going to put it in a package, see what happens. Well, you know, thankfully I was selected. So I'll be going there. You do virtual, then you do a week in New Hampshire, and then you do another virtual week. So I think just the knowledge of, because I don't have an MBA, um, I think the knowledge that I'm going to get there from, you know, the professors, the other students, the te- like, there's so many good things that, you know, the entrepreneurs that are there or things like what you can learn from the other people and, you know, the mm-hmm. networking, I'm super excited about. You know, and then Syracuse has another program where they'll pay for a, it's a granted program where they'll pay for a professional certification for you. And all the trainings, you know, and videos and everything, it's really, it's like, this is all there for you. Like, it doesn't cost you anything. So, of course, I did that. May have bitten off a little more than I can do right now, but I do that a lot. So, we'll see what happens with that. Um, You know, I'm trying to get an HR certificate through that, but. Like, there's so many things out there. Again, there's so many resources for veterans or retirees that people just sometimes it's like it's there for you. You served your country. Go, you know, this is for you. Yeah. Take it. I mean, you know, take it. I got it. Like, you know, um, you know, here's me at 45 and I'm still doing that. But you, it's just like I said, you, you got to create your own destiny. You got to create your own life. And you know, we've, we've created a good life for ourselves. Um, um, so I'm going to ask awesome. the last, last question, uh, sadly, mm-hmm. which is if you had to take the oath again, would you? Absolutely. Hands down. And I will put this out there last, last little tidbit, but if there's anybody that listens to this podcast, if you're a civilian thinking about military service, please reach out to me. I don't care. However it is, uh, whatever your info you need for me tab. Um, but especially females. Um, yeah. If we could just have a 20 minute conversation and we could just open your eyes a little bit to the opportunities that could be before you. That's more of what our military needs. Our, our recruiters are phenomenal. All services. They have a tough job. But sometimes, you know, if you could just talk to us, um, us ladies, um, and we could explain things a little differently, you know, get that little female kinship going on. I think that's, that's more of what's needed. This is the Oath We Took podcast, and you just heard a piece of Sarah's story. You now know one more Marine and one more piece of Marine Corps history. Her sacrifices matter. Her stories matter. Not every Marine story is the same. We didn't all join the Marine Corps for the same reason. What is the same is the oath we all took. An oath that easily could have ended in death, and for some, it did. So listeners, instead of asking you to thank a Marine for their service, I am going to challenge you to continue to listen to their stories instead.